know, it's a question, I suppose, of where we start. And I suppose we ought to start with when we first met, or at least whether we met or not, I'm not quite sure, but we, we were aware of each other. And that's in um, January 1954, 60 years ago now, uh, when it was extremely cold, and we both came up to take the scholarship examination at Exeter College. Um, and it's, I've sort of worked out since that they obviously arranged us alphabetically around a big table to sit our papers. So that they started on one end of the table with the letter A and went down there and came back up the other side to the letters at the end of the alphabet, so that V was about opposite B. And I remember sitting there, and there were two people opposite me. One was called Bennett and the other was called Bear Park. And they had marvellous handwriting. Their handwriting was much better than mine. And they seemed to spend a lot of time writing where I was sitting there feeling sort of terrible and not knowing what to write. Um, so I think we sort of saw each other ac across the table then. Um, I don't remember much at all, actually, about, that, about the scholarship examination itself, except, as I was saying earlier on, for the, the sort of general essay, which I, I think was a two-hour paper, or it might have been a three-hour paper, and you turned the paper over, and there was a subject, and you wrote about it. So we turned the paper over, and it said, apathy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And my heart sort of sank to my boots, and then I, I realised that about a fortnight before, at school, I'd done a test paper, and, and that was on enthusiasm. <laughs> so I, I simply tur sort of turned it inside out, and it appeared to work. Um, <laughs> I remember also uh, then um, being wonderfully impressed by all these young men who... Um, you know, in the evening, they went to the cinema. Whereas I sat in my room <laughs> and was terrified, really, about what was going to happen the next day. All I can remember doing is going to uh, Parker's Bookshop, which was then on the corner of Churl Street, and buying a copy, which was then, I think, a new book of Ernst Gombrich's The Story of Art. Because so I thought we might get a question on art the next day, and I really ought to read up about it. We didn't, but I've still got the book. And it has my unformed handwriting, D.G. Vesey, 7 January 1954, uh, in the front. Uh, I don't, those are my memories. Do you have any? Uh, no, I, can, I can remember, uh, I mean, exactly the, your impression of me is my impression of you, in the sense that it, you wrote an enormous amount uh, and that you had very grown-up handwriting. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, other than that, I, I just remember being very cold. You were sort of toasted on one side and frozen on the other side. Um, uh, but um, my, I mean, I presume your, um, your route to, the, to, the, to that point from was fairly straightforward from school, wasn't it? Um, yes, it was. Well, yeah. that's yours. Was well, mine, was, mine was, uh, I was going to say, I, I got there by a dog's hind leg, as it were. <laughs> But, uh, but I shouldn't say it like that, because it, it meant that I went to Cambridge first before I came to Oxford. Uh, um, what happened was, I, I, in 1951, um, went to, I was at a state school in Leeds, Leeds Modern School, um, and um, it normally, uh, if it sent anybody to university, it was to Leeds University down the road. But uh, we had a new headmaster who'd been at Cambridge, and he decided to, to uh, put uh, some of the sixth form uh, in for Oxford and Cambridge. I don't think we were any cleverer than the, than the, the average, really. But anyway, he wanted us to go in for it, um, and then left it to us. Uh, so we had to write off to the college for uh, prospectuses and so on, and you get you no idea about um, about the the hierarchy of the colleges, or or that there was any difference, for instance, between Magdalen and Exeter, which uh, you know there was no idea that there was a social difference between the colleges. Um, but uh, so we were left just to to work it out for ourselves. Um, and then I've, I've written something about this. Now, uh, in the course of this uh, 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 of the evening, I'll um, I'll keep going back to stuff that I've written already. Um, and it all had to be decided at home. 
the wireless off, the kitchen table cleared and wiped. No more certain way of being rejected, I thought, than jam on the entrance form. <laughs> and in the mystifying permutations of choice, my parents stood by helpless. They scarcely knew what a university was, let alone the status of its component parts. I opted for Sydney Sussex College at Cambridge, which sounded to be a middling sort of college, though, as I'll explain, I ended up at Exeter, at Exeter College here, another middling sort of college. <laughs> I reckoned I'd stand a better chance uh, at Sydney or Exeter than I would at socially more exalted colleges like Trinity or Magdalen. The irony was, when I finally landed up at Exeter in 1954, I found that in my callow assessment of college form, I had not been alone. Others had reasoned in the same way, with the result that Exeter was far harder to get into than anywhere else. <laughs> the first hurdle, more intimidating to me than, uh, than any examination, was having to go up to Cambridge and stay in the college for the weekend. I had seldom been away from home and was not equipped for travel. I fancy a sponge bag had to be bought, but since at 17 I still didn't shave, there wasn't much to go in it. <laughs> My mother probably invested in some better pyjamas for me, but that was it. A stock vision of an undergraduate then, gleaned from movies like Robert Taylor in A Yank at Oxford, was of a young man in dressing gown and slippers, a towel round his neck en route for the distant baths. I didn't run to a dressing gown and slippers either. Nobody'll mind if you, if you just wear your raincoat, my mother, <laughs> my mother reassuringly said. I wasn't reassured, but there was a limit to what my parents could afford. It all seems absurd now, but not then. For all I knew, someone who went to the baths in a raincoat in his ordinary shoes might not be the sort of undergraduate the college was looking for. <laughs> and droll though these misgivings seem, then they were more real than any worries about, uh, about the examination itself, and they persisted long after examinations were over. My social and class self-consciousness not entirely shed until long after my education proper was finished. December 1951 was sunny but bitterly cold, and though there was no snow, the cam was frozen, and the lawns and quadrangles white with frost, and coming to it from the soot and grime of the West Riding, I had never seen or imagined a place of such beauty. And even today, the only place that has enchanted me as much as Cambridge did then is Venice. All eight of us got into Oxford and Cam or Cambridge, some after one or two tries, but some actually winning scholarships. I didn't win a scholarship, I got a place at Sydney Sussex to read history, coming up after my national service in 1954. My basic training in, uh, we, everybody had to do national service then, and my uh, basic training was in the infantry uh, in the York and Lancaster Regiment at Pontefract. Um, and uh, I'd been told by, other by old boys coming back to school that I was to ask to go on the Russian course. Uh, nobody would know what the Russian course was, but one had to keep asking, and eventually they would get through. So I did, I said, I want to go on the Russian course, and eventually uh, I was posted to Coolsdon, uh, and um, there you started to learn Russian, uh, and the top 50% of the intake uh, went to Cambridge. Uh, and the beauty of this was not merely being in Cambridge, but you didn't have to wear uniform, and you didn't have any uh, drill, and your connection with the army was, was almost nominal. Uh, and it was wonderful. Uh, I, I mean, in some ways, it was far more um, eye-opening and enjoyable than, than university was. Um, but as the months passed, and most of, the, most of the other people learning Russian were like me, were going on to, to university. As the months passed, I began to feel that since I could hold my own with these boys in Russian, maybe I ought to have another shot at getting a scholarship myself. Besides, I was at Cambridge already. Perhaps, rather than come back there after national service, I would be better, more rounded, I fear I thought of it, 
going to Oxford. This first occurred to me in October 1953, and having written off for the prospectuses, I found I could take the scholarship examination at Exeter College, Oxford, in the following January. There was no practical advantage to getting a scholarship. It carried more prestige, certainly, but no more money. Uh, in those days, uh, and it's, uh, I still think it's the best system that we could ever have had, uh, and it's a great lack that we don't have it today. Uh, in those days, if you got a place in any uh, institution of higher learning, then your fees would be paid either by the state or by your local authority. Um, and so if, if you got a college scholarship, then that would be taken off the money that the state would pay. Um, there was no practical advantage in getting a scholarship. It carried more prestige, certainly, but no more money. At Oxford, scholars wore a longer gown than commoners and had an extra year in college rather than in digs. But that apart, I wanted a scholarship out of sheer vanity. If I was to take the examination at Exeter, I didn't have much time. My history was rusty, and studying Russian during the day meant that the only time I had to myself was in the evenings which I generally spent in the Cambridge Public Library. In the meantime, I reduced everything I knew to a set of notes with answers to possible questions and odd eye-catching quotations, all written out on a, on a series of 40 or 50 correspondence cards, a handful of which I carried in my pocket wherever I went. I learned them in class while ostensibly doing Russian, on the bus coming into Cambridge in the morning, and in any odd moment that presented itself. Come the examination, everything tumbled out. Facts, quotations, all the stuff I'd laboriously committed to memory over the previous three months. My only problem was lack of time. When the letter came saying I'd won a scholarship, I thought life was never going to be the same again, though it quite soon was, of course. <laughs> well, that accounts for all that writing, if he's just regurgitating all this. Um, Anyway, as you've seen, Alan was, as it were, the clever brigade. He'd, he'd gone and done Russian in his national service. Um, I was still at school, um, which meant that, that when we actually got to Oxford, um, Alan was two years ahead of me because between school and my coming up, I had to do my national service, which was entirely different from, from Alan's because nobody ever told me about the Russian course. <laughs> and I didn't have that little wheeze. Um, I just. I, I was an infantryman, I, I joined the Gloucestershire Regiment, was commissioned um, and went off to uh, fight in, in the Mau Mau emergency in, in Kenya. Um, so then after all that, uh, where I did, I didn't learn Russian there, but I did learn Swahili, all of, all of which has now vanished, <laughs> I must say, but I don't know about your Russian, but uh, my Swahili is gone pretty well. Although actually in the, in, in the, where, where my wife now lives, in, in her care home, there are quite a few carers who, from Kenya, and I practice my Swahili on them, <laughs> not, not letting them know how I learned it, under what circumstances. Um, so when we, when we went to, we got to, uh, we got to Exeter, Alan, as I said, was two years ahead of me. And I think it's, it's really quite a, quite a tribute, really, to, to the Oxford College system that, um, I mean, admittedly, we're reading the same subject, and we're, we're sort of, uh, you know, uh, come from the same background of sort of lower and middle class, paid for education um, background, that, that two people so different really and two years apart can, can meet and um, become firm friends. Um, Exeter was, was a very, it was a small college then, um, and it was a very good college in that there were no cliques, uh, there were no sort of bloodies on the one hand and, and aesthetes on the other. Uh, we were all one. There were very, very few graduate students. We were all undergraduates. And there were very few dons. There were only 14 dons um, at, at Exeter, all of them teaching uh, when, when we came up. There are now 44, most of them not teaching at all. <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't know what end of an undergraduate from another, I think. Um, and, and the, in particular at, at Exeter, the, the junior common room, there wasn't a middle common room, of course, um, the junior common room was a very important place and it was, wasn't political in the least. It was purely a social club. 
It was the place where one met uh, and um, played darts and shoved halfpenny and ate tea and talked and set the world to rights. Um, and of course, we were, we were older then than undergraduates are now, two years older on the whole, uh, because um, for almost all subjects, unless you, unless you were a medic, I think you could do your national service after you'd done your undergraduate work. But you know, when you got your offer of a place, it was on condition that you will come up in two years time rather than now. And we were not, and I think probably the, also the, one of the effects of having done national service was that we'd learned, I mean, there, there, pro there, all, there were clearly problems in the college. There are problems in all aspects of life. But I think through being in the army, one had learned uh, to obey orders, but actually circumvent the, the problems. <laughs> we, we, didn't you know, we didn't raise them into matters of principle and protest and march about the streets. Uh, I don't think it was a protesting. We were, we were before the protesting no, generation. Well, it, it was quite inward looking as well. We did, I mean, yeah. though the, the president of the union, was, uh, Philip Whitehead, was, who later became a Labour MP, uh, he was uh, he was a Texeter, mm. but but somehow uh, it, you switched off really p politically speaking. I think in college it was uh, there was no uh, later on. I think in in the sixties um, later on. I think uh, uh, it, it was very different. But when we were there, it was uh, very easy going. And and I, my contem other contemporaries in other colleges, I, for instance. I'd been in the army with Michael Frayne, the playwright, um, and I used to, we used to write to each other. And he uh, was at Emmanuel in, at Cambridge, which he didn't like at all. Uh, and uh, he couldn't understand how I was so um, settled in college, really, so happy in college. And, and he, he immediately took part in the, in, in the life of the university, really, in varsity and so on. Um, whereas uh, I never did it, uh, and, uh, and I think as most people in Exeter didn't, really. Uh, One or two people got involved in the union. But yeah. I think. Well, also, the, it, it, uh, it's quite interesting. I just jotted down a few things about how life was so different in 1954 um, than it is now, the things that we just uh, take for granted now, a lot of them hadn't happened then. Um, not, I mean, man hadn't gone into space. Uh, the Beatles hadn't yet sung. Um, the Berlin Wall hadn't even been built. No one had ever heard of Rupert Murdoch. Um, he'd just gone down, actually. He'd just gone back to Australia from uh, being a, an undergraduate here at, uh, at Worcester College. There was no television, no colour television and no, no television at all in, in college. There were no supermarkets in the town, except possibly the co-op and Woolworths, if you count that as a supermarket. Um, Harold Macmillan hadn't yet become prime minister and told us we'd never had it so good. Um, and, and Margaret Thatcher was still advising Joe Lyons on how to make his ice cream uh, less hard. <laughs> She invented emulsifiers for his ice cream. Um, and Didcot Power Station, which is now being blown up, hadn't even been built. <laughs> so that the, the, you know, that, that great landmark, as you come back from London on the train, you think, oh, I'm nearly home, there's Didcot Power Station. It wasn't there when we came up to Oxford. What was the landmark that told us we were nearly, nearly at Oxford? I wonder. Well, the whole, the, whole, uh, the whole smell of Oxford was different in the sense that the Nothing had been restored, had it? The, the, the buildings were peeling and scrofulous, and um, uh, the the uh, the Empress heads outside the Sheldonian were uh, almost unrecognisable, weren't they? Uh, and um, it, uh, but then so were most provincial towns. Uh, it, it was quiet, uh, and uh, Cambridge was the same because. Uh, you could walk through Cambridge on a Saturday afternoon and hear your own footsteps. Uh, there were so few people about. And it was true even of places like York, which uh, now is, uh, you can't move in York, but th then it was empty. Uh, and you say this to people and they think you're romanticising, but, uh, but it was so. Um, but one of the reasons why I think we got to know each other uh, well, was because uh, I had rooms in college 
uh, for, uh, over quite a long period for various reasons. Uh, I began by um, having a room on, in the front quad of Texeter. No, the first, no, I'll, I'll read the, the, the uh, I'd forgotten this. Um, I, I'll read an account of what happened when the first uh, uh, day I arrived at, uh, at uh, Exeter when, and, uh, when I found where I'd been put in a room. You're from Yorkshire and he's from Yorkshire. You're from a state school and he's from a state school. You're reading history and he's reading history. You seem to me, and Rector Barber gave what I took to be a smile, you seem to me to be very well suited. <laughs> so my first disappointment with Oxford was finding I was going to have to share. But the disappointment turned to consternation when I found I'd been put in with someone uh, with whom on the Russian course I'd intermittently shared a barrack room and a bedroom for much of my two years in the army. He was amiable enough, much more so than I was, and far more convivial, but he was no more anxious to share with me than I with him. It was this depressing prospect that had emboldened me to knock on the door of the lodgings the first day I arrived and asked to be moved. Though a kindly enough man, Rector Barber had an air of death in life about him <laughs> that is caught well in the Anigoni portrait now hanging in Exeter Hall. A classicist from the age of Hausmann, he made even that austere figure seem jolly. <laughs> and certainly I got no joy that day. I came away thinking, well, I'm here for three years and that's put paid to the first year. <laughs> it hadn't, but I have to say that though I ended up staying at Oxford, not for three years, but for eight, the place inspires little nostalgia. Still, it was at Oxford that I first had a room of my own. Uh, and then I go on to describe the, the, the furnishings of the, of, of the room, some of which I still have. Uh, uh, I bought um, uh, an old um, battered Victorian gilt mirror, uh, which was falling apart when I bought it for, I think it was three pounds here. Uh, and, uh, and it's still falling apart now where it hangs at the top of our kitchen stairs. Um, I, uh, at Cambridge there were, uh, there were some good, um, because I think it had a school of architecture, there were um, some good shops for um, modern furniture and, and wallpaper and such like. And thinking of the room I was imagining I was going to have in my first year, I bought um, a roll of wallpaper. Uh, and um, I, it, it's sad to think of it really, but... Uh, I don't think many undergraduates arrive on their first day with a roll of <laughs> wallpaper under their arm, but I did. And then, of course, I couldn't put it up. Um, and so it was only in my second year I got a room, uh, the room overlooking Extra Garden and, uh, and All Souls. Um, I'm cutting out the boring bit. <laughs> <laughs> But the other, that's another thing about, about uh, Oxford then. It was full of, uh, well, junk shops, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, the, the, there were the posh antique shops down the high street, but uh, Walton Street particularly had lots of junk shops, uh, and, uh, where, which had really good stuff in them, uh, and, uh, and, and, and cheap. Um, I, um, I bought a... Um, uh, down Little Clarendon Street was Kirill Bonfilioli, a colourful character, now I think revealed as possibly a spy and, <laughs> and certainly an accomplished detective story writer. He sold me for a few pounds a little oil sketch of an oriental market that he thought might be by W.J. Muller, of whom I'd never heard. Years later, I took it into the Fine Arts Society in Bond Street, where a young man glanced briefly at it before saying kindly, Yes. <laughs> uh, well, Muller painted some bad pictures, <laughs> but I'm afraid this is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed on at Oxford after I took my degree and in due course got larger rooms, which I could even buy furniture. And this is when I think we knew each other best, when I had the room. I had um, a room 
it's the room with an oriel window at the, uh, at the uh, end of Exeter's Broad Street frontage, um, looking over the emperor's heads and, um, uh, and the Museum of Science building. Um, I bought over Magdalen Bridge and just up the London Road on the left, I bought a Victorian marble top chiffonier for six pounds, which is still in our kitchen today. In 1958, it had to be taken up the high street on a handcart. I mean, it, 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 one, one has to think twice to, to, to think whether this has really happened. It seems so, <laughs> so Victorian, but anyway, it was so. Um. Yes, um, uh. <laughs> well, my, my turn is it. Yeah, well... Um, I've got lots of stories, well, I'm sure you have as well. <laughs> well so I, yeah. Um, yeah, the other thing was to, I mean, very few people, we travelled by, we travelled around Oxford by bike, really, or yeah. walked, didn't we? And very few of us came up by car. We all came up by train and carried very little kit with us. Nowadays, you have to have a kind of four-by-four four vehicle to carry your children off to university. Then we just put our stuff in a suitcase, sent it passenger luggage in advance, and at the beginning of every term, uh, railway trucks would deposit vast quantities of suitcases in every college lodge, and you had to sort out yours. That's something that's completely forgotten now. Um, and also, you felt, you felt it was a class marker that you had a suitcase and not a great big cabin trunk. That's right, uh, yes. And with that's your initials on it. That's uh, right. Lots of cabin trunks went to Trinity College. <laughs> very, very few came to Exeter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Oxford was a funny place too. I mean, everybody eats out a lot of the time now, but very few people used to eat out. I mean, Mr. and Mrs average English person didn't eat out much, uh, except if they were staying in hotels or if they wanted eth Indian food, really. Other otherwise, everybody ate at home and there weren't many. I mean, if we, if we wanted to eat out, we would have sort of omelettes or mixed grills or something at one of the very few. There was the stowaway, I remember, which was always known as Stuffers um, <laughs> and the Lantern. Uh, and there were sort of classy tea rooms, Fuller's um, and the Cadena, but they were um, where you took your mother, really. It's not where you... Or didn't, I think. Or didn't, or didn't uh, yeah. take your mother, yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, I was going to ask you that. What did, how, uh, were you self-conscious about asking when your parents came yes, up to see you? very, very. Because uh, it would have been an absolutely strange world yeah. for them. And it would have been a, a sort of strange world world for me to have them in the, in the Oxford situation. I mean, I don't take any pride in that. I'm rather ashamed of it no. now. No, I but, I'm um, the same. But, uh, but you see, my, when mine came up, I mean, I think they only came up twice, uh, I practically put a sack over their heads. <laughs> uh, uh, and they were the most, uh, I mean, uh, lovely people. And, and, you know, they weren't... Th I, I learned my lesson uh, then, actually, at uh, the time, because uh, one of my friends at Exeter was Russell Harty. Now, uh, Russell's parents were green grocers uh, on the market in Blackburn, uh, and they were absolutely what my mother would have called common. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, Fred uh, looked like a bookie uh, and wore a, a bold uh, check uh, suit, uh, and, um, and Myrtle, his, his wife, uh, was uh, thin as a rail and, uh, and highly painted and, uh, and both of them were absolutely sure of themselves. There was no, there was no putting sacks over their heads. Uh, but Russell, you see, wasn't in the least bit uh, embarrassed by them. Uh, uh, and in fact, when they came up to see him, he held a cocktail party for them uh, and, uh, and asked uh, the rector and asked the dons to... to uh, <laughs> And he was, he was reading English, so he was taught by Neville Coghill. Uh, and, um, and Neville Coghill had a conversation with uh, Fred, Russell's father, about uh, uh, Mrs. Sarty, uh, and I put this in a play. Uh, um, uh, Myrtle said, uh, my husband uh, introduced the avocado pear to Blackburn. <laughs> uh, and... and uh, 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 and never thought, did she really? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, and well, was genuinely interested. He'd never come across people like this before. Uh, and uh, they had a lively conversation. Uh, and uh, and uh, it, it was... 
so different from, from uh, my attitude to my parents, yet I could see it was better, and morally better than, my, than me, really. Uh, I, and I never ceased to regret it. Um, but uh, but th then I think, I think also, we were, we were both historians. Um, I got to know in, uh, some of the people doing English, and they had a much uh, more, uh, I mean, our tutors, uh, Eric Kemp, who was the chaplain, and Greg Barr, who was the senior tutor. Um, I don't think we were on terms with them. Certainly we weren't on first name terms with them. Uh, whereas uh, the uh, English people I knew called Neville Coghill Neville. Uh, they went out to supper with him. Uh, they were ta also taught by a man, a uh, good teacher called Arthur Ashby, who and they used to go out to the, to the, um, uh, the, the what was it, what's the pub at Burford? The, um, um, the Bay Tree, no. The Bay Tree, yes, no. the Bay Tree at Burford, and had a high old time. Uh, and it was so different from, from our rather strained relations with our tutors. Yes, we did. They were strained. They were, yes, we both had the same tutors. And uh, talking about, you know, uh, being familiar with one's mm. tutors, even when I came back to Oxford, I left for three years and then came back again and started sort of doing things around the university. That, for instance, um, one of the people I used to have to write to about various things was um, Roger Highfield at um, Merton. And I would write to him, dear Dr. Highfield, and he would write back to me, dear Mr. Vasey. And after a bit, he, he, one of his letters said, surely we can be a little less formal now, which meant that he wrote to me as dear Vasey, and I wrote to him as dear Highfield. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was, that was very good, yeah. yes. But they, he, he, you, he was an education in a sense, uh, seeing some of the people who, um, who taught you. Um, I, I, I've only written one play um, set in Oxford, which was um, uh, The Habit of Art, which is uh, uh, imagining a meeting between W.H. Auden, who came back here in uh, about 1972, uh, thinking to have a happy retirement in Oxford, um, but finding himself very unhappy here. Um, uh, an imaginary meeting between him and Benjamin Britten, who were, with whom he'd worked when they were younger. Uh, and it was when Benjamin Britten was writing uh, Death in Venice and, uh, and had come to a full stop. And the play imagines the meeting and, and seeing whether they could work together again. Um, but uh, it begins in a rather uh, oblique way, a rather French farcical way, in that... Um, Auden is also expecting uh, a call from a rent boy who, he's, uh, who, uh, who we regularly used to have a rent boy in New York, but they always had to arrive absolutely on the dot. Uh, if they were five minutes late, then they were sent away. Uh, and so he's expecting this, uh, this boy. Um, but it also somebody from the BBC comes, and of course, Auden thinks the man from the BBC is the rent boy. <laughs> but anyway. Um, the Rent Boy uh, is a subsidiary character, but towards the end of the play, he really gets, he gets a speech in which he talks about um, going to uh, visit uh, Don's. Uh, and um, it's really an account uh, of, of what it was like being taught by one of the Don's in, in North, North Oxford. Uh, and so I'll read that, um, if I can find it. Here we are. Some of the yearning felt in this play by Stuart, the, the rent boy, in the houses of his clientele, reflects my own wonder as an undergraduate going to tutorials in the vast Victorian houses of North Oxford. I was there on a different and more legitimate errand from Stuart, but to see a wall covered in books was an education in itself, though visual and aesthetic, as much as intellectual. Books do furnish a room, and some of these rooms had little else, and there in a corner, the dawn under a lamp. Sometimes, though, there would be paintings, and occasionally more pictures than I'd ever seen on one wall, together with vases, urns, pottery, and other relics, real nests of a scholarly life. And there were wonders, too. 
drinking soup once from 15th century apostle spoons, medieval embroidery thrown over chair backs, a plaque in the hall that might be by Della Robbia. These days I think of such houses when I go to museums like the Ashmolean or the Fitzwilliam, where the great masterpieces are plumped out with the fruits of bequests from umpteen academic households. Paintings, particularly in the Fitzwilliam, antiquities, treasures brought back from Egypt and Italy in more franchised days than ours, squiddled away up Norham Road and Parktown, the components of what Stuart rightly sees as a world from which he will forever be excluded, and from which I felt excluded too, though with less reason. Um, I can't even remember the names of the tutors I went to, but there were... There was Atkinson, did you go to C.T. Atkinson? Yes, I did go to Atkinson. Um, yeah. Who was practically yeah. blind and, and yeah. had himself matriculated in the yeah. 1890s and ga <laughs> gave up lecturing in the university where, when women were allowed to take degrees. I mean, he was a really unre <laughs> unreconstructed character. Um, yes, uh, he, he, even I could see that he was a bit beyond a joke, really. Um, <laughs> but he, he, our, our tutors weren't of the most inspiring. And some of the lectures that one used to go to weren't very inspiring either, I think. Really, uh, you know, object lessons in how to make an interesting subject boring. <laughs> um, it, was, it was better, I used to find, to go and read. Except some, uh, certainly in the one postgraduate year that I did in, in the Bodleian Library, learning how to be an archivist. Going to two very contrasting um, and very, very learned people about manuscripts. Pierre Chaplet, who did the diplomatic, and Neil Carr, who was the most marvellous paleographer, but an absolutely hopeless lecturer. I mean, we just sit there saying, I think paleography is an unteachable subject. <laughs> it's so, whereas Pierre Chaplet was just wonderful. It was partly because he had, a, he had a, this wonderful French accent and, and, you know, would glide over these lovely Latin He'd phrases. He'd been in the resistance, hadn't he? Yes, he had. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I remember yeah. he lived at Ensham, and I lived at Ensham in those days, and Travelling in one day on the bus in winter time, um, I was complaining about the cold and how, how awful the snow was and all that. And he said, um, ah, he said, uh, I, you know, I never complain now because it could never be as bad as the winter of 1944. So I said, oh, where were you in 1944? And he said, Buchenwald. <laughs> I, I wanted to sort of slide under the seat. <laughs> uh. I, it, lecture, some lectures were, were terrible, uh, and I even I fell asleep in A.J.P. Taylor's lectures, uh, <laughs> uh, which you know he was he could lecture at nine o'clock and fill the house, but he, he it was the relentless paradox of his lectures that that uh, m made me go to sleep. But the most impressive lecture I, I ever went to uh, was by Richard Pears, uh, and Richard Pears was um, a don at All Souls. Uh, and uh, and he, uh, it was in my last, last the, over the, I think over the last two terms that I was an undergraduate, where you don't really expect to go to lectures because you're so busy mugging up the, you know, what you've done. But uh, for some reason I went, uh, and uh, to find that um, most of the audience were dons. Uh, and, and then pairs came in, or was brought in, and he was in a wheelchair, and, uh, and he was brought in by, I think, John Bromley, who was a lecturer in geography, who sat by him and helped him with his papers. And it became immediately obvious that he was very ill. Uh, and he was, um, he was lecturing about the sugar interest in 18th century politics um, uh, and how, uh, it, uh, how the, the, the plantations and so on uh, set up families like uh, the Lassels and, uh, and, and how this affected them. Uh, and it's not an inspiring subject, it's not like uh, a topic, say, from the 17th century, which could be uh, ennobling or inspiring. It was about, about people behaving badly, really. Um, and the fact there was this man who quite plainly was dying and yet thought this was worth doing and that it was uh, and that history in itself was worth doing made an enormous impression on me and i i kept on going to the lectures and uh, week by week he became visibly weaker so that um 
by, by the end, uh, John Bromley was having to turn over the pages for him, much like a, uh, somebody turning over for a pianist. Uh, and the only thing that was really uh, remained unaffected was his voice. Uh, and uh, I've never forgotten that. Uh, but it was nothing. To, it was it was a human uh, impression it made on me, you know, rather than the historical one. Um, but uh, the, the otherwise, the number of memorable lectures uh, were very few. Uh, but I mind, I, I mind you, I I uh, after I take my degree, I uh, stayed on and um, did research and taught a bit. And I was a hopeless teacher, so I'm no. <laughs> I, I, I was um, so bad uh, that, uh, that I would have been stopped today within a term, I'm sure. But uh, I, I could, re I recommended books to my pupils to read, but, and, I, and I'd read them, but I couldn't remember what was in them. <laughs> uh, and I always used to run out of things to say uh, two thirds of the way through the tutorial. So I took to putting the clock on beforehand. <laughs> So, poor things, they, they used to arrive thinking they were on the dot or even early and found it was ten past the hour. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I don't know how they put up with me, but anyway, uh, it, uh, I, 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 so I, I sympathise with, uh, with, uh, with our tutors. I'm sure that I must have bored them, really, probably, <laughs> as well. The only, the only, we ought to move on from Oxford, actually, but I, I do remember... Uh, being elected to something called the Stubbs Society. I wonder if that society still exists. It was a his history society, um, and you could only be a member as a don if you'd been a member as an undergraduate, and the undergraduates were elected. But there, there were two caucuses in the Stubbs Society, one based on Queen's College and the other based on Balliol College, and they were always at war. So I think I, I was elected because I was in neither camp, and they all, oh, here's a nice chap we can vote for, and I got elected. But it was the most savage society. They used to have very, um, very uh, eminent speakers and tear them to pieces. These clever—I mean, I was not clever at all, but I mean, they, they used to tear these uh, speakers to pieces. Um, however, when I, when I, as I say, I left Oxford, worked away for three years, and then came back again, and I thought, well, I was a member of the Stubbs Society when I was an undergraduate. I think I'll write to the secretary and say, can I have a term card? I'd like to come along again, please. And I got a very, very snotty letter back from, from the secretary saying, no, no, this is for proper dons. This isn't for people who work in libraries. <laughs> Eventually, when I became head of Western Manuscripts and, and, and a fellow of Exeter, um, they, they wrote, the, the sub society wrote to me and asked me to give a paper, and I said no. <laughs> it gave me great pleasure to do that. But maybe, yes, but of course you stayed on to do, to do research. I, I, I stayed on to do research, and, I, and despite my... And I, was, I was taught by, uh, or my supervised by a wonderful uh, teacher, Bruce McFarlane, who was a medievalist at Magdalen, and, and who was... Uh, it was the first time I'd been taught by anybody who, who was really inspiring, and yet, looking back, uh, very often I'd go and see him, and he wouldn't even talk about the thing I was supposed to be researching. He'd be just... Uh, chat and, and and yet I came away thinking uh, Richard the second which was my subject was the only thing I wanted to do uh, and he was a wonderful teacher and a wonderful uh, historian he, he uh, uh, and so uh, uh, that uh, that was the best thing about being a postgraduate but I, I was made uh, I simply simply because I taught their their pupils I was made um, uh, a junior lecturer at Magdalen, uh, and um, this was uh, a mixed blessing, really. I, because uh, Magdalen was was full of stars. I mean, uh, A. J. P. Taylor, uh, uh, Geoffrey Warnock, um, Gilbert Ryle, uh, uh, fearsome people, really. Uh, and of course, one dined in, you see, as and I. Uh, I found the, the meals at high table were absolutely terrifying, <laughs> uh, and uh, the, and it was it was a large common room, uh, and uh, on three nights in succession I sat next to the same person, uh, and he turned to me and said, uh, uh, "And who are you? Uh, now, who are you?" Is a question you really can't answer. If you say, "What do you do?" You, you can answer that, but who are you? You know, it's quite difficult. Anyway, I. I uh, botched together some answer. 
The next night, the same person was sitting next to me, and he said the same thing. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the third night, the same thing, and it was, uh, it, it was beyond, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do, I was just so out of my depth. And the food, um, I've always found eating food in public quite difficult, but anyway, Maudlin, it was a nightmare. Uh, and the worst time was getting towards Christmas when they had mince pies. And you didn't get an individual mince pie, uh, a scout would appear with a large general mince pie uh, and a silver slice and you were to cut a slice from the mince pie and transfer it to your plate, which is logistically quite difficult anyway. Uh, and then behind him was another scout uh, with a silver spoon uh, and a flagon of brandy. Uh, and he uh, uh, poured the flagon of brandy and uh, uh, filled the spoon and gave you the spoon. Then there was another scout behind him <laughs> with a silver Bunsen burner. <laughs> and, and you were meant to... Nobody explained this to you, you had to deduce it. Uh, you, you were then meant to heat the spoon over the Bunsen burner and then pour it over your mince pie. Uh, whereupon yet another scout <laughs> Were, was behind with a flagon of cream and you took the cream and doused the mince pie. I mean, you were a nervous wreck by the time you got there. <laughs> but what made it worse was being the junior, I, everybody long since, I was the last to be served, so I was, uh, you know, I, I was still doing this when everybody long since finished. <laughs> and it wouldn't have been so bad if it had been in, uh, as it were, laboratory conditions, but you know, there, there were, everybody was watching and there were people, you know, there were people like A.J.P. Taylor there, and, and I was sitting opposite Gilbert Ryle. It's like sitting opposite Mount Rushmore. <laughs> uh, it was uh, terrifying, and I, uh, uh, I, I was eventually, I, of course, I, I deserted academic life for, uh, for the theatre, and uh, no, I never had stage fright uh, in a theatre like I did going to uh, High Table at Maudley. And there was another, I, I seem to remember another occasion, I, I seem to remember you coming back one night from Morley, where your, the sleeves you were oh, yeah. in a oh, gown yeah. got caught. Yeah. That's right. yeah. I, 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 uh, I, I wasn't used to wearing a, a BA gown with its long sleeves, and, um, and I, as I pulled, pushed my chair in, my sleeves got caught under the <laughs> legs of my chair, uh, which was severely <laughs> restricting, you see. And, I, um, and they were bringing around these dishes, and of course, I, I, because I was too shy to stand up and move the chair back, I had to sort of wave them away. Uh, you know, as more and, and the food was delicious, I must say, but I had to wave it all away. And, uh, and, and then the Don next to me said, uh, if you're a vegetarian, they'll do you something special. Uh, uh, it was... Oh, I mean, it seems, it is funny now, but then I, oh, God, I'm miserable with it. Oh. Yes, I won't forget that, you know, after, after you've been on the high table for a bit, you forget how yes, nerve-wracking right. it is yeah. when you first start to go on. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. The same thing about the, the, the tools coming over one's shoulder. Yeah. I had the same thing exactly. I was sitting on the, the right-hand side of the, of the uh, promise of Oriel. And so it was the first person to be served. And this huge fish came over <laughs> with a fish slice. No indication what I was, you know, which bit you had to cut off. Or anything. But I, I think I did pluck up courage there and say, I, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> but uh, yes, but then I suppose, yeah, we ought to talk before, I, we've just been given the signal that we ought to stop. Oh, really? Right, all right. right. Oh, we, 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 we it's all been about around. Oxford, hasn't it? Yes, yeah. I mean, yes. We, we did leave Oxford eventually. Um, I mean, I came back again, but uh, um, I certainly had... I, I went off and did three years in Stafford, which was very, very... I mean, it was... Up to that point, I realised now, I'd always been a member of a kind of ready-made society. You know, family, school, army college and then suddenly you were chucked off the top of this ivory tower and had to make your own way in a Midlands town where I'd never been before in my life and I was very un very sort of um, socially un 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 unhappy for a while actually but there were some some marvellous people there <laughs> and uh, I remember for instance I worked for the county council and in the 
in the, the canteen where we used to go and have lunch, there was always an old man sitting having his lunch all by himself. And he was a chap who wrote the, in those days, there was still a, a calligrapher who wrote the county council's deeds and wrote, wrote the, uh, all the county council's documents. And this was a chap called Sidney Barnes who'd probably been the greatest fast bowler that England had ever had, who was a man who was too old to be in the First World War. And yet there he was in 19, whatever it was, I mean, 60. Um, he was there, in, in, and we, I was absolutely in awe of this chap, this beautiful handwriting at some really advanced age. And say and about it, um, Palmer. Oh, yeah, the Palmer, Palmer the Poisoner. Yes, that was somebody who... who uh, well, I just remember you yes. writing to me about this. Yes. Uh, well, very in, there, but there were some real characters there. When I, when I really got, got in there and realised what an exciting life this was, because you could still make really major historical discoveries in country houses and coal mine offices and all that sort of thing. And we used to have to go and visit all the country clergymen to see what they were doing with their records. And there was a wonderful, completely mad clergyman in a little... A uh, little village called Flash, which was up on the, up on the sort of Staffordshire, Derbyshire moorland, um, who was li lived a life completely sort of cut off from the world and very much objected to the, bishop, the way the Bishop of Lichfield wrote to him as James Lichfield. Um, and this chap's name was Tom something. And he always wrote back to the Bishop, Tommy Flash. He always <laughs> said <it>, Tommy Flash. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, yes, I think that... Uh, oh, do you want us to... to, to uh, perhaps we'll stop there, James. Now, uh, I was, I'm going to finish off with something totally different. Um, not funny at all. Um, and it's... Uh, about uh, a year ago, I was asked to... Uh, if I would preach a sermon before the university at Cambridge. Uh, and my instinct was to say no, and then I thought, well, I, I, I would try and think of something I really wanted to say and something which was quite close to my heart. And, um, uh, and I preached um, on the subject of education and on, on the subject of private education. Uh, and, and on uh, that it was time, uh, well, well overdue really, uh, for an amalgamation between state education and private education, if only to begin with at sixth form level. Uh, and uh, I, I preached this sermon uh, at the beginning of June this year in King's College Chapel. And I'm not normally nervous if I've got my text in front of me, but uh, I was very nervous then simply because of the architecture. I mean, this is one of the finest buildings in Europe. And to find yourself speaking in it and having to speak quite slowly uh, because of the echo was quite daunting, but anyway, this is uh, this is what uh, the end of the of the what I said. Unlike today's ide ideologues, I have no fear of the state. I was educated at the expense of the state, both at school and university. My father's life was saved by the state, as on one occasion was my own. This would be the nanny state a sneering appellation that gets short shrift with me. Without the state, I would not be standing here today. I have no time for the ideology masquerading as pragmatism that would strip the state of its benevolent functions and make them occasions for profit. And why roll back the state only to be rolled over by the corporate entities that have been allowed, nay encouraged, to take its place? I am uneasy when prisons are run for profit, or health services either. The rewards of probation and the, allevi and the alleviation of suffering are human profits and nothing to do with balance sheets. These days, no institution is immune. In my last play, the Church of England is planning to sell off Winchester Cathedral. Why not, says a character? The school is private, why shouldn't the cathedral be also? And it's a joke, but it's no longer far-fetched. With ideology masquerading as pragmatism, profit is now the sole yardstick against which all our institutions must be me measured. A policy that comes not from experience, but from assumptions, false assumptions, about human nature, with greed and self-interest 
taken to be its only reliable attribute. In pursuit of profit, the state and all that goes with it is sold from under us who are its rightful owners, and with a frenzy and dedication that call up memories of an earlier iconoclasm. One pastime I had as a boy, which, thanks to my partner Rupert Thomas, I resumed in middle age, was looking at old churches, church bibbing, Larkin dismissively called it, though we perhaps have a little more expertise than Larkin disingenuously claimed he had. I do know what Rudloffs were, for instance, though like Larkin, I'm not always able to date a roof. The charm of most medieval churches often consists in what history has left, and one learns to delight in little, the dregs of history. A few 15th century bench ends, an alabaster tomb chest, or, where the glass is concerned, just the leavings of bigotry, ideology weakening when it came to out of the reach tracery, the hammer too heavy, the ladder too short, so that only fragments of the glass survive, a cluster of crockets and towers maybe, the glimpse of a golden city with a devil leering down. In my bleaker moments, these shards of history seem to me emblematic, obviously, of what has happened to England in the past, but a reminder and a warning of what in other respects is continuing to happen in the present, with the fabric of the state, and the welfare state in particular, stealthily dismantled as once the fabric of churches more rudely was, sold off, farmed out, another dissolution, with profit taking precedence over any other consideration, and the perpetrators today as locked into their ideology and convinced of their rightness as any of the devout louts who four and five hundred years ago stove in the windows and scratched out the faces of the saints as a passport to heaven. And I end with the last lines of my first play, 40 years on. To let a valuable site at the crossroads of the world, at present on offer to corporate clients, outlying portions of the estate already disposed of to sitting tenants, of some historical and period interest, some alterations and improvements necessary. <laughs>